dear students today we are going to discuss about the british novel paper number 3 and in which we will be talking about the block 4 that is actually about james joyce and in fact james joyce is a very important uh, novelist actually from ireland and a poet considered to be one of the most influential writers in the modernist avant garde of the 20th of early 20th century so he is considered a very important and famous novelist of english literature joyce is best known for ulysses that was published in 1922 and considered a landmark work in which the episodes of homer's odyssey are paralleled in an array of contrasting literary styles perhaps most prominent among these the stream of consciousness technique he perfected so as you know actually ulysses uh, one of the most important works by james joyce that uh, uh, you see offers the technique of stream of consciousness that is you see the special feature of james joyce other major works are the short story collection dubliners and the novels a portrait of the artist as a young man uh, and fenagans wake so these are other works actually written by uh, james joyce uh, so as we were talking my dear friends about the stream of consciousness technique that he perfected and that is usually found in his works this is the special feature of his poetry this is the special feature of his works this is the special feature Uh, that is found in his novels also that stream uh, of consciousness technique so we will be talking about a stream of uh, consciousness technique also and uh, its its uh, presentation in his works and all that we will be discussing in coming slides uh, so as we were talking uh, joyce's work has been subject to intense scrutiny by scholars of all types all types of critics and writers and uh, different uh, people from the different fields uh, they have evaluated they have uh, uh, they have critically examined the work of joyce and he has also been an important influence on writers and scholars as diverse as samuel beckett salman rushdie and joseph campbell uh, so he uh, at the one hand he has been uh, you see uh, criticized he has been examined by different writers and uh, on the other hand you see he has influenced many writers like samuel beckett shalman rushdi and joseph campbell etc and ulysses has been called a demonstration and summation of the entire modernist movement french literary theorist Julia Kristeva characterized Joyce's novel writing as polyphonic and hallmark of postmodernity. So as we were talking actually Julia Kristeva you see uh, she very clearly says that the the novel writing of Joyce uh, was a kind of polyphonic writing and it's a, it's a kind of hallmark it's a kind of hallmark of postmodernity or postmodernism literature so those special features are very much there they are visible in the writings of james joyce and some scholars most notably uh, vladimir novokov have mixed feelings on his work often championing some of his fiction while condemning other works in novokov's opinion ulysses was brilliant so novokov's a very uh, internationally acclaimed scholar Uh, you see says that ulysses was brilliant and it was you see uh, a very fine piece of work written by uh, james joyce so this was the popularity this was the uh, you see influence of james joyce on other writers and this is how actually he created a different nike a different place uh, for him in english literature in 199 in 1999 my dear friends time magazine named joyce one of the 100 most important people of the 20th century and it stated joyce revolutionized the 20th century fiction so you see 
uh, Time magazine, you see, uh, 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 called, uh, announced James Joyce as one of the top 100 people of 20th century and stated Joyce revolutionized 20th century fiction, that Joyce, Joyce was the one who, who created a kind of sensation, a kind of revolution in the fiction of 20th century. So this was how, this was how you see, he created a kind of different place. The work and life of Joyce is celebrated annually on 16th June, known as Bloomsday in Dublin, and in an increasing number of cities worldwide, and critical studies in scholarly publications such as James Joyce Quarterly continue. So, considering the importance of his works and his popularity, you see people have started celebrating his, uh, you see, uh, uh, 16th June as, uh, you see, Bloom's Day in Dublin and where, uh, you see, everywhere they, 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 they do actually critical uh, publications and scholarly works in the memory of James Joyce. Both popular and academic uses of Joyce work were hampered by restrictions placed by Stephen James Joyce, Joyce's grandson and executor of his literary estate. On 1st January 2012, those restrictions were lessened by the expiry of copyright protection for much of the published work of James Joyce. So, uh, as we were talking, you see, so when actually because of the copyright uh, uh, protections were less, then actually there was more freedom. Earlier, uh, there were some limitations regarding his works. Now we come for the discussion and uh, you see the analysis of the work that is prescribed in our syllabus, my dear friends. And the work written by James Joyce that is prescribed in our syllabus is a portrait of the artist as a young man. A portrait of the artist as a young man, say, it's a very, uh, you see, important uh, piece of work. It's a, it's a very uh, popular and a celebrated text by, uh, you see, uh, James Joyce. So here we go for, uh, you see, story and other things. We will uh, be trying to understand uh, the things that are related to this text. A portrait of the artist as a young man is the first novel of Irish writer James Joyce, you see. It's a very important point. Uh, this, this, a portrait of the artist as a young man is the first novel of Irish writer James Jones. <laughs> James Joyce, it traces the intellectual and religio-philosophical awakening of young Stephen Dedalus. Because Stephen Dedalus is the protagonist, the important character of this novel. A fictional alter ego of Joyce and an allusion to Daedalus, the consummate craftsman of Greek mythology. So there is a, is a, you see, a portrayal of the character of Stephen Daedalus, and that is represented through the character of James Joyce also. So there we will we will find some some kind of uh, similarities. Some, uh, you see, uh, the patchups between uh, the the protagonist of this novel and. James Joyce himself. Stephen questions and rebels against the Catholic and Irish conventions under which he has grown, culminating in his self-exile from Ireland to Europe. The work uses techniques that Joyce developed more fully in Ulysses and Finnegan's way. So, as we were talking in our earlier slides, my dear friends, you see, here in this uh, uh, novel in this work, uh, we will be uh, able to see that a stream of consciousness technique that is, you see, very specific feature that is the speciality of James Joyce. And for the stream uh, of consciousness, my dear friends, you see, James Joyce is known all over and he is perfect and in fact he perfected that art of consciousness later on in his coming works like Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake and etc. So, as we have already discussed that this is the, the first novel written by James Joyce. So, uh, it was the first time when he used the stream of uh, consciousness technique in this novel. And later on he tried to perfect, later on he tried to, you see, enrich that quality in, in his other works and other novels. A portrait 
began life in uh, 1903 as Stephen Hero, a projected 63 chapter autobiographical novel in a realistic style. So, this is also once again a very important thing to note down uh, that you see it was started in 1903 and earlier it was uh, an autobiographical novel that uh, were having around 63 chapters and uh, so many other things were there. And after 25 chapters, Joyce abandoned Stephen Hero in 1907 and set to reworking its themes and protagonist into a condensed five chapter novel, dispensing with strict realism and making extensive use of free interactive speech that allows the reader to peer into Stephen's developing consciousness. So, you see, uh, uh, you see later on when uh, he realized when when Joyce realized that that uh, you see uh, the autobiographical touch and the 63 chapters that would have been very big actually, and that won't work. So he decided later on that, and he thought that uh, it will not be uh, you see that kind of uh, popular thing. Then he curtailed the thing actually, and in 1998 the Modern Library named the novel third on its list of 100 best English language novels of the 20th century, you see. So, it will be a very uh, a pivotal thing to note down, you see, that a modern library, uh, you see, named and announced this novel as one of the uh, very important novels of 20th century and it was placed on third number. So, it, uh, among all the works, it was very popular. It was, you see, uh, it was only on the third number only two novels were ahead of this novel. So, th that was the kind of popularity and plot and story lineup and characterization of James Joyce that made the novel very popular among the masses. Here we go for characterization, my dear friends. You see, Stephen Dadalus. So, the main character of portrait of the artist as a young man is a protagonist. He is a protagonist of this, uh, you see, work. And growing up, Stephen goes through long phases of hedonism and deep religiosity. He eventually adopts a philosophy of aestheticism, greatly valuing beauty and art. Stephen is essentially Joyce's alter ego. As we were talking, you see, in Stephen we find a kind of characterization, a kind of reflection of the personality of, a kind of reflection of the personality of, you see, James Joyce. And many of the events of Stephen's life mirror events from Joy's own youth. His surname is taken from the ancient Greek mythical figure Daedalus. It's a very, uh, you see, important thing once again to note down. Uh, the surname of Mr. Daedalus, Stephen Daedalus, is taken from the ancient Greek mythical figure Daedalus, who also engaged in a struggle for autonomy. So, you see, it's a kind of mythical character. It's a kind of Greek uh, mythical figure. So, uh, it's, it, it has got some kind of influences from the Greek mythology also. Simon Dadless, Stephen's father, an impoverished former medical student with a strong sense of Irish nationalism. Sentimental about his past, Simon Dadless frequently reminisces about his youth, loosely based on Joyce's own father and their relationship. So, because we know actually the relationship between Stephen Dadless and Simon Dadless was not good. So, it is all the representation of the relationship of James Joyce and his father. And that, uh, you see, those feelings and those uh, emotions are expressed here also. Now, here we come for Emma Clare, uh, Stephen's beloved. She was Stephen's beloved the young girl to whom he is fiercely attracted over the course of many years. And Stephen uh, constructs Emma as an ideal of femininity, even though or because he does not know her well. So, you see, uh, 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 she was the beloved of Stephen Dadless, the protagonist of the novel. And Charles Stewart Parnell, another very important character who he, who is never mentioned in the novel, but his death actually uh, influences the different characters. And you see, he has got an indirect 
influence on the different characters. He has got an indirect influence, indirect, indirect uh, phase of influence on different characters, uh, you see, of the noble. So here we go, actually, an Irish political leader who is not an actual character in the novel, my dear friends. He is not an actual character, but whose death influences many of its characters. Parnell had powerfully led the Irish parliamentary party until he was driven out of public life after his affair with a married woman was exposed. Foreignly, Stephen's best friend at university, in whom he confides some of his thoughts and feelings, in this sense, Cranley represents a secular confessor for Stephen. Eventually, Cranley begins to encourage Stephen to confirm to the bishes of his family and to try harder to fit in with his fears. Advice that is Stephen fiercely reasons. Towards the conclusion of the novel, he bears witness to Stephen's exposition of his aesthetic philosophy. Towards the conclusion of the novel, he bears witness to Stephen's exposition of his aesthetic philosophy. So, this was about the important characters, my dear friends, of uh, this novel, where Stephen Dadless is the protagonist. And here we go for synopsis, and here we will be uh, trying to understand the important features, the, the story lineup, that, and uh, how and why the things uh, go in one particular direction and we would like to understand the Stephen Dadless uh, characters because he is the, the one who influences the novel and who, who, uh, who uh, does things in the novel, who takes the things ahead in the novel. So, here we go for synopsis, my dear friends. The childhood of Stephen Dadless is recounted using vocabulary that changes as he grows in a boy's not his own, but sensitive to his feelings. The reader experiences Stephen's fears and bewilderment as he comes to terms with the world in a series of disjointed episodes. So, the, the earlier life of Mr. Dadless was very uh, cool and calm and he used to live life and later on actually he, he got surprised when he saw the, the world actually and he could understand the situations outside. And then Stephen attends the Jesuit run uh, Klongo's Wood College, where the apprehensive, intellectually gifted boy suffers the ridicule of his classmates while he learns the schoolboy codes of behavior. So, uh, my dear friends, actually, we were, uh, 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 we are told about his, uh, you see, the starting education and the school is education and different things. While he cannot grasp their significance at a Christmas dinner, he is witness to the social, political and religious tensions in Ireland involving Charles Stewart Parnell. So, you see, actually, uh, in his life, he sees some social, political and religious tensions also of Ireland, which dry bases between members of his family, leaving Stephen with doubts over which social institutions he can place his faith on. So, uh, you see, those all kind of uh, taruma and uh, uh, anxiety actually that was there in the members of his family that created a kind of doubt in the mind of Stephen Dadless. And finally, they had to leave the place. So, back at Klongoves, word spreads that a number of older boys have been caught smugging. Discipline is tightened and the Jesuits uh, increase use of corporal punishment. And later on, when it was found that some of the students actually, they were involved in smuggling and all. So, you see the discipline got tightened and some of them were given, you see, corporal punishment. Stephen is strapped when one of his instructors believes he has broken his glasses to avoid studying. So, you see, uh, uh, because when it came into notice that he broke his glasses to avoid studying. But prodded by his classmates, Stephen works up the courage to complain to the rector, Father Konmi, who assures him there uh, will be no such recurrence, leaving Stephen with a sense of triumph. So, uh, you see, situations were uh, adversely changing in the life of Stephen, uh, deadless actually. Then, Stephen's father gets into debt. 
you see the situations uh, con consistently were changing and later on you see uh, 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 this was very much too much for Stephen that his father gets into much debt and the family leaves its pleasant uh, suburban home to live in Dublin. Uh, Stephen realizes that he will not return to Klongov's, however, thanks to a scholarship obtained for him by Father Konemi, Stephen is able to attend Belvedere College. And later on, you see, it was very difficult because of their family situations and all. It was very difficult for him to study in the same Klongov's college. But it was the time when he got a kind of a scholarship. It was the time when he got a kind of a scholarship from, you see, Father Konemi, where, you see, Stephen was able to attend uh, Belvedere College, where he excels academically and becomes a class leader. And you see, his performance was so extremely good. His performance was so uh, uh, very good that he, he became the class leader there. He became an extraordinary student there. And then Stephen squanders a large cash prize from his school and begins to see prostitutes. And you see, that was the another phase once again in his life. You see, when actually he was winning cash prizes. And because of the cash prizes, you see, and he uh, finally thought of going to the prostitutes. And he started going to the prostitutes as distance grows between him and his drunken father because there was no understanding between him and his drunken father. And you see, he chose a different path, and, and he started moving on a different path, and there he, uh, he went. As Stephen abandons himself to sensual pleasures, his class is taken on a religious retreat, where the boys sit through sermons. Stephen pays special attention to those on pride, guilt, punishment, and the four last things, death, judgment, hell and heaven. So actually, uh, as we were talking, my dear friends, he, he became uh, more sensual and he was more into sensuous pleasures and other things. So he started going to the, to the sensual pleasures. He feels that the words of the sermon are directed at himself and overwhelmed comes to desire forgiveness. Overjoyed uh, uh, at his return to the church, he devotes himself to acts of repentance though they soon develop to mere acts of routine as his thoughts turn elsewhere. So, you see, actually, uh, it, this was the time when he was under dilemma. He could not understand the situations uh, that what to do, actually. At one hand, he was very much attracted towards the sensual pleasures. Uh, on the other hand, he was attracted towards the, the Christian values and the Christianity. So, it was the highest dilemma of uh, his life actually and he could not decide what to do, what not to do. His devotion comes to the attention of the Jesuits uh, and they encourage him to consider entering the priesthood. And Jesuits and other people were encouraging him to enter into the priesthood. Stephen takes time to consider and it was very difficult for Stephen to decide where to go, where not to go. Uh, but has a crisis of faith because of the conflict between his spiritual beliefs and his aesthetic ambitions. There were conflicts. The, and there were conflicts because of his past and the present, actually. At one time, he was between in the, he was between in the spiritual beliefs and aesthetic ambitions. He could not decide what to do. He could not decide where to go along uh, Dolly Mount Strand. He sports a girl bedding and has an epiphany in which he is overcome with the desire to find a way to express her beauty in his writing. So, he could not decide actually where to go, where not to go. Uh, so, that was a very critical phase of his life. As a student at University College Dublin, Stephen grows increasingly wary of the institutions around him. Church, school, politics and family. In the midst of the disintegration of his family's fortunes, his father berates him and his mother urges him to return to the church. His mother asks him to come to the church and increasingly dry, humorless Stephen explains his alienation from the church and the aesthetic theory he has developed to his friends who find that they cannot accept either of them. So Stephen concludes that Ireland is too restricted to allow him to express himself fully as an artist. So this was the conclusion of Stephen actually. 
and he says very clearly that Ireland is too restricted to allow him to express himself fully as an artist. So he decides that he will leave to leave. He will have to leave. He sets his mind on self-imposed exile, but not without declaring in his diary his ties to his homeland. So uh, this is how actually he he quits finally. As far as the style is concerned, uh, we will be talking about the style. The novel mixes third person narrative with free indirect speech, which allows both uh, identification with the distance from Stephen. The narrator refrains from judgment. The omniscient narrator of the earlier Stephen hero uh, uh, informs the reader as Stephen sets out to write some pages of sorry words, while portrait gives only Stephen's attempts leaving the evaluation of the reader. The novel, as a matter of fact, is written primarily as a third person narrative with minimal dialogue until the final chapter. There are minimal dialogues actually. This chapter includes dialogue intensive scenes alternatively involving Stephen, Davin and Cranley. An example of such a scene is the one in which Stephen posits his complex Thomist aesthetic theory is an extended dialogue. So primarily it is written in the third person narrative and where actually the dialogue forms have been used. Joyce employs first person narration for Stephen's diary entries in the concluding pages of the novel, perhaps to suggest uh, that Stephen has finally found his own voice and no longer needs to observe the stories of others. Joyce fully employs the free indirect style to demonstrate Stephen's intellectual development from his childhood, through his education to his increasing independence and ultimate exile from Ireland as a young man. The style of the work progresses through each of its five chapters. The style of the work progresses through each of its five chapters as the complexity of language and Stephen's ability to comprehend the world around him both gradually increase. The book's opening pages communicate Stephen's first strings of consciousness when he is a child. So opening pages actually uh, discuss about the, 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 the beginning phase of Stephen's life throughout the work language is used to describe indirectly the state of mind of the protagonist and the subjective effect of the events of his life. The writing style is notable about for a uh, joyous omission of quotation marks, he indicates dialogue by beginning a paragraph with a dash, as is commonly used in French, Spanish or Russian publications. So that is the special feature that is used in this, uh, you see, uh, portrait of the artist as a young man. So thank you very much. Hope you have got the idea of Stephen Dadless and this novel. Thank you very much.